during the era of the early republic, when the United States was still in its infancy, the Federalists advocated that the national government must be able to successfully engage other nations in the international community in order to ensure effective government at home. The Federalists made it clear that the Union of 13 States would only succeed if the national government was vested with enough power to speak on behalf of all states. During the early Republic, the Federalists adhered to the principle that the Constitution empowered the federal government to speak for the nation in international affairs. Federalists also believed that this meant that the states were prohibited for meddling with foreign affairs policy. Even in the antebellum period, right before the Civil War, Chief Justice Taney, a Democrat who strongly favored states' rights, agreed with other U.S. Supreme Court justices that a state could not extradite a fugitive to a foreign government. The logic behind this decision was that if states had the ability to extradite fugitives to foreign governments, this would undercut national policy. And if we jump forward to around World War II, the court ruled that no state can rewrite foreign policy to conform to its own domestic policy. And decades later, the Rehnquist Court would rule in the 2000 landmark case Crosby v. National Foreign Trade Council that the state of Massachusetts could not prevent its governmental agencies from buying goods and services from companies conducting businesses with Burma. While it may seem as though the court has traditionally discouraged states from meddling in international matters, as of late there have been new trends in the international system of states. In fact, both political science and criminal justice scholars argue that the world order is undergoing a critical transformation one that is premised on the key notion that our sovereign nation state, the U.S., is currently being supplemented by other nationals, by other actors, excuse me. In the world of politics of today, multinational corporations and subnational units such as states within the U.S. are gaining greater influence over the realm and practice of international politics. For example, recently the country of Taiwan has lobbied states on international matters. Taiwan persuaded several states within the U.S. to adopt resolutions favoring its membership in the World Trade Organization. Mexico has also lobbied states within the U.S. rather than the country as a whole. So the question is, does the U.S. Supreme Court, what, is, what does it think of this type of behavior? Well, the answer in a nutshell is it's complicated. Today, amidst a backdrop of economic globalization, more states than ever before are aggressively seeking an international presence. Needless to say, this has presented the court with great challenges as it struggles to answer just how much American states should be permitted to pursue their own foreign policy. In today's economic climate, as states within the U.S. are struggling to emerge from the Great Recession, policymakers realize that economic recovery may very well hinge on the capacity of states to expand their export economies. Many states within the U.S. are now implementing a strong international component and are selling goods to consumers throughout the world in countries such as Brazil, India, and China. Today, states not only seek more markets for their exports, but also act to attract more foreign direct investment for their own workers. Foreign-owned businesses operating within the United States tend to pay high wages. As federal dollars flowing to the states have become scarcer, states are looking for viable alternatives. This might mean looking toward the international market. So how much autonomy should states have in the international arena? While he was in office, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed an agreement binding California and the United Kingdom to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In your opinion, 
Is this type of contract binding or constitutional? What might make, uh, what would the Supreme Court have to say about this type of an agreement? Again, the answer is it's complicated, especially considering the fact that in recent years, Congress has often encouraged state participation in foreign policy, at least to some extent. So long as no one objects, it is likely that state governments will continue to participate in the global arena, even implementing their own foreign policy initiatives. Key cases from the Roberts Court suggest that it may be less cooperative with the national government on some foreign policy issues. For example, in the 2008 case, Medellin versus Texas, the state of Texas was not bound by an international treaty. Mexico sued the United States in the International Court of Justice, arguing that the U.S. had violated the, Vene the, Vene excuse me, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, which requires that local authorities inform foreign nationals being held on criminal charges of their right to consult with their country's diplomats. The Bush administration, by the way, agreed with Mexico and briefed the Supreme Court on the obligation to comply with international treaties. However, in a 6-3 to three decision, the U.S. Supreme Court rejected the Bush administration's arguments and cleared the way for Texas to execute the sentence. Interestingly, since the Medellin case, the court has also refused to grant other similarly situated inmates stays of executions despite the objections of the Obama administration. Apparently, the Roberts Court will not accept the foreign policy concerns of the nation as enough justification to interfere with state criminal justice operations. Another issue which is worth mentioning is should the U.S. Supreme Court acknowledge what other countries are doing when it rules on issues? For example, in the 2003 case, Atkins v. Virginia, which abolished the execution of mentally retarded offenders, members of the U.S. Supreme Court readily admitted that their decision was influenced by the international political and legal system. This would also happen two years later in the landmark case Lawrence v. Texas, which abolished the execution of juvenile offenders. Supreme Court Justice Anton Scalia takes his colleagues to task for relying on foreign law to strike down state laws within the U.S., but some justices, such as Anthony Kennedy, who, by the way, was appointed by a Republican, some justices, such as he, are not nearly as reluctant to embrace foreign law. This is a topic which is certainly worth examining. Is it wise for the court to look abroad or adopt foreign precedents in deciding hot-button issues such as gay marriage, health care, or even the death penalty? While there is no doubt that the Ringquest Court scaled back federal governmental power, it is less certain as to what precise role the Roberts Court will play in advancing states' rights. The Roberts Court will have to forge its own identity. Keep in mind that the Roberts Court is still fairly young and has only endured six terms. Also, every time a new justice is appointed, the dynamics of the court obviously change. This is a point that Stevens made in his memoir. President Obama nominated Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan to the court, and the Senate confirmed both nominations. These two justices have moved the court considerably to the left, and let us not forget that one never knows how a justice will vote. After all, Chief Justice John Roberts, probably one of the most conservative justices on the court, switched sides midway through deliberations to uphold Obamacare after failing to find middle ground with conservatives. Next week, we will begin reading Jeffrey Tubin's book, The Oath. And in this book, Tubin goes into what happened behind the scenes when the Affordable Care Act was being decided. Tubin contends that Roberts switched his vote and in the process infuriated Justice Antonin Scalia. Roberts was the deciding vote to uphold the Affordable Care Act, and he wrote the majority 5-4 opinion. 
Many states' rights advocates would say that the Affordable Care Act represents the ultimate encroachment on states' rights. It is highly unlikely that the Rehnquist Court would have decided the case in the same manner. So while we do not know exactly how the Roberts Courts will, will rule in areas related to states' rights, I think it is very safe to assume that it will take a position which is more to the left. Both Justice Antonin Scalia and Justice Clarence Thomas are longtime Supreme Court justices who have a protectionist view of state power, but they presently seem to be outnumbered. It will be most interesting to see how these the two justices mesh with Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan, the two newest members of the Roberts Court. One thing we need to know about the Roberts Court is that it is not nearly as assertive as the Rehnquist Court was in striking down federal laws. Nevertheless, it has not by any means been a puppet of Congress. In a 2011 case, Sossamon versus Texas, the court ruled that Congress lacked the authority to let Texas be sued in a private action for monetary damages. This was a 6-2 to two decision and liberal justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg joined the majority. If you may recall, this case involves religious freedom among prisoners. Interestingly, the Rehnquist Court had invalidated an earlier version of this law in 1993 but Congress was determined to pass this and drafted a new law, the Federal Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which was passed in 2000. This law probably passed because there was quite a bit of common ground between Democratic and Republican legislators. Generally, legislators across both sides of the aisle tend to be committed to granting inmates religious freedom, as this may be conducive to rehabilitation. But in the Sossamon case, the court ruled that even though Texas accepted grant money from the federal government, it did not waive its right to sovereign immunity. The court ruled that Congress simply lacked the authority to let Texas be sued in a private action for monetary damages. This is an interesting case, especially given the relationship between the U.S. Supreme Court and the Congress in regards to this issue of religious freedom among inmates. There's a lot of history here. For some reason, the court has been rather resistant to this while Congress has done everything possible to provide this. I think this is worthy of more scholarly examination and might make a very interesting mini paper.